are we going to have a strike in the auto industry? I mean, it kind of feels like it. And, Huge. Uh, and that could push, by the way, uh, not yeah. only the state of Michigan into yep. a recession, but if it goes on for a long time, it could be bad for uh, the growth trajectory of the U.S. economy and for the inflation, underlying inflation numbers. Yep, there's, yeah. it's big. So hopefully they can get something done. Joe Levington joins us here. He's a director, credit research for Bloomberg Intelligence, and his day job, he covers kind of the industrial companies, including the auto companies. He joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. So, Joe, what's your sense here? You know these companies for a long time. Does this feel like they're going to go on strike? The, uh, the union will go on strike Thursday at midnight? Yeah, no, definitely, Paul. It does feel like a strike is coming. You know, even when uh, you see uh, Bloomberg reporting that the um, that the UAW has offered some concessions, going from 40% growth to 36% growth is still a huge difference between the 14 and a half percent that uh, the auto companies seem to be giving. So, so let's look at the let's get the hard numbers behind that. This is what they want in terms of an increase for salary and benefits, right, Joel? So, what does it boil down to in terms of? the cost for the automakers to get an hour of work from a union member. Yeah, no, you're totally right. The way that I've looked at it is really in terms of EBIT for 2024, in terms of profitability. Uh, for uh, in the best case scenario at 20%, you'd have something like Stellantis being about 2% impacted. So really not that much before you consider some of the things that they could do. For Ford, which has a bigger unionized auto group, it could be as much as 10% of 2024 EBIT. Now, I do think there are ways that they can offset it uh, and going to your point about inflation, price is the number one tool that they have to use is to increase prices and pass it on to consumers. Of course, that leads to different challenges and different Which they've and also losers. done numerous times over the past couple of years. That's you know? exactly right. When, you're I, when I price my Dodge Challenger RT Scat Pack widebody. Which has still not been delivered. Which still has not been delivered. <laughs> and I, I, I hear, by the way, from inside the company, they're like, yeah, you know what? I, I think it's going to be delivered September 15th. And now that's just three days away, and I've gotten bupkis in terms of... Anyway, the, 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 well, the bottom line is when I ordered it in, you know, a, a year ago, it's the price has already been increased like two or three times. And I'm wondering, do I have to then pay that price? But when they finally deliver it, <laughs> I don't know how that works. No, so, it, it, in fact, you don't have to pay that price, but that's where some of the EV companies are getting hit uh, materially, like a, a Rivian or a Lucid, which made deals two or three years ago, and now they're you know, like offering these cars up at 30% less than what the price is today, and they're taking that loss and gross profit and really killing their liquidity. So to your point, you, you won't have to get hit with that, Matt, but you did have to wait, and that's- I bet you the dealer's gonna cool. try. I'll yeah. bet the dealer tries. <laughs> but you're a savvy auto guy. You're not Well, now because Joel told me that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, would say, I, I have know documentation I know yeah. the from owner, the day I ordered. I know the yeah. owner of uh, Stellantis, the CEO of Stellantis. Um, all right, so. It doesn't help. The dealer does not care. <laughs> it doesn't care? Okay. <laughs> I've interviewed Carlos T Tavares. That doesn't help me when I go into the dealership. <laughs> all right, so, Joel, if you're these big auto companies, you don't want to go on strike, but you feel like you can't pay a 30% or 40% increase in so where do you think this shakes out? I mean, yeah, I, I think you probably get to a midpoint of maybe about 25% over four years. Now, the offsets to that is, you know, if you increase pricing 1%, that takes a huge chunk of that uh, increase away. And then you start thinking about costs and where you can do that. One of the things that I always think about is uh, bringing in uh, products uh, that you, you have gotten from suppliers, so insourcing some componentry. If you do that, that means uh, you might be saving money. That might be a pressure point for a lot of the auto suppliers uh, and how they're going to get hit. Uh, obviously, if you're going for pricing, that's a positive for the dealers and what that means for them. Well, uh, if they can move the metal, because consider that these increases are only going to hit GM, Ford, and Stellantis. So if you're cross-shopping, say, the new, newest GM electric vehicle on a Tesla, and Tesla has to pay its employees like a third of what GM pays their employees, um, you're, you're gonna find a better price over at Elon Musk's company. I think you're totally right, Matt. I, I also, I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago, how, how Tesla might actually be the biggest winner. Now, I'm sure uh, folks in uh, Tesla's plants see a, let's say 25% increase, and they're gonna be asking for something too, but my guess is it's incremental or modest relative to what the UAW is gonna get. So on a relative basis, Tesla is gonna win on that. And as you've seen what they've done this year is they've used that price to cut their prices or take a relative price cut. 
and draw demand off of it, which I think means that Tesla will be, you know, like the eventual winner out of the <laughs> out of this game with the auto companies. And the others who produce here that don't have union labor, right? Which is like a ton of Asian and European automakers. So like the BMW plants in Tennessee or wherever they put them? South Carolina. South Carolina, are they not unionized? They're not. And so, Ooh. you know, like there is gonna be a relative treat here in terms of how much you can go. And it's one of the reasons why the auto companies are pushing back so hard because they play in a global market space. I don't know. So, all right, from the- You gotta decide as a worker, Paul. Do you wanna live in Spartanburg? Do you wanna live in Austin? Do you wanna live in Motown? Uh, probably Spartanburg is looking pretty good to <laughs> yeah. me. Um, all right, so from the balance sheet perspective, Joel, do any of these uh, Ford, GM, Stellantis, do they have a balance sheet that you're nervous about? Should a long strike take place? Well, the thing that I look at the most, and this is really a Ford and GM issue more than a Stellantis issue, is that the way that they get paid is that they get paid when they sell the car to the dealer, right? But they don't pay their suppliers until your typical 45 or 60 days afterwards. What that means is that they have a huge amount of payables that are lined up and very little receivables. When you have a stoppage of work, there's no receivable money coming in, but there's a huge amount of payables <laughs> to the tune of maybe like $5 billion a quarter. So you have to have massive amounts of liquidity to handle kind of such a situation, which is really what Ford and GM have. I think Ford has something like 50 billion of liquidity available. GM has about $45 billion of liquidity available. So they can handle a near-term impact, but it has a huge uh, view in terms of free cash flow for a year. Uh, in terms of the liquidity on their balance sheet. They got, uh, they got a lot of leverage that, here. I'm looking at GM. I mean, they got a debt to EBITDA. I mean, that's there's a lot there. There, There is, but keep in mind that that includes the finance company. When you strip okay. that out, if the leverage at GM and Ford is actually relatively modest, like okay. maybe more like uh, one to one and a half turns. Okay. Um, it's really that they have finance companies, which is, is kind of hard to see. Uh, sometimes just because it's blended all together under their under their primary. Now, center. I will say everyone we talked to from uh, we talked to Seth Harris yesterday at Northeastern, who uh, used to be an advisor to President Biden and uh, deputy director of the White House's National Economic Council and Claudia Som, she of the Som rule. Um, they all say, look, the union took bad deals for the yes, workers what I was at the end of the financial crisis um, and the car makers have raked it in since then. Surely they've been setting aside billions because they knew these negotiations were coming, right? Surely. <laughs> <laughs> but sarcastic. you're right. I mean, they, they kind of, they got a certain deal, a certain pay increase, and then this inflation came along, which nobody saw. And then, boom, now they feel like they need to get it back. It's going to be interesting. It feels, uh, it feels contentious. Hopefully they can get something done by midnight uh, Thursday night. Especially so, if they haven't produced my Challenger. I know. Yeah, I mean, because I need them to make that and send it here. That I know. should be the priority of the negotiation. The whole thing. We got to get that thing off the line.